Welcome to Job Sharing and Beyond, the future of work podcast that goes beyond the traditional nine to five. I am Karen Tischler, speaker, consultant, and host of the show, where we hear from global experts every other week to discover innovative solutions and tips on how to remain a relevant employer in the future. Welcome everyone. I am really excited to introduce my guest today. Our conversation fits very well to last weekend's Unpaid Care Worker Day, or commonly known as Mother's Day. My guest, Christy Reibel, is the founder of The Human Group, a leadership consultancy focused on developing leaders who are intelligent across gender, culture, and generation. She's committed to humanizing the workplace through leadership programming and coaching initiatives that look deeply at the integration of work, life, and family, and how we show up for ourselves and for others. She is an advocate for working mothers and also teaches a course at Stanford on the topic of motherhood and work. Her international leadership experience spans more than 20 years of working across technology and consumer products for both public and startup ventures throughout Latin America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. To every consulting, teaching, or coaching engagement, she brings an intercultural and multidisciplinary perspective. Welcome to the show, Christy. Thank you for having me, Karen. Thank you so much for coming onto the show today, Christy. Now for our listeners, could you share with them, please, where you're calling in from and if there is a particular site or food item that you can recommend from your area? Sure. So I am calling in today from Northern California, from the San Francisco Bay Area, and I live over on the East Bay. Um, as far as sites and foods, there are so many in the Bay Area. Definitely brings together a lot of different cultures, which makes for lots of great food. And the sites, I'm sure you've seen before, the Golden Gate Bridge. But the one interesting place that I will bring up today is if you travel east from Oakland and you keep heading east towards Lake ha Tahoe, there's a town called Pleasanton. And in Pleasanton, there is a drive through convenience store and ice cream stop called the Meadowlark Dairy. And the dairy has been around since the 1900s. And this drive through has been there since 1969. And it is absolutely a do not miss stop for ice cream. And there's nothing like it. And during the pandemic, when the world went drive through, it um, definitely... <laughs> was visited uh, by my kids and myself often. So it's a, it's a great place. Thank you so much for sharing. Christy, you are the founder of the human group with two U's, humanizing the workplace and developing human first leaders. You've worked around the world with many different companies and cultures. Could you tell our listeners, please, more about your background and the human group? Absolutely. I would love to. I think at its core, um, I have always been deeply interested in people and what makes them tick and especially um, in a cultural context. Right. And so my background leading up to founding the human group, which I founded in 2019, is wide and varied, but people have always been at the center point and the core of what I've done. So I originally have been fascinated with culture since I was a little kid. I think that came from flipping through my parents' National Geographic magazines. And that really led me to study what I studied in college, which is classical archaeology and African studies. And from there, not to tell my entire life story, but I ended up going into international business at some time post-college. And 
really, I fell into the wireless telecom industry during that time. And it was a fascinating time. It was when wireless was just burgeoning and all of the world was deregulating their telecom at this point in time, right? And so my, my very first job at a business school was in that space of working with countries in that deregulating process. But the piece that I held in that around the buying spectrum piece was really getting to deeply understand the cultures and the people and the buying behaviors of those people in those countries. And would they be using wireless? What would that look like? And so I really was able to to kind of dig deep into the cultures of the places that we were possibly going to be entering from a wireless telecom perspective. And so most of my career was in the wireless space. Um, After that point in time, it brought me to the Bay Area and I worked for a company that was pre-iPhone, but it was really the first mobile communications device. The company is called Danger and the mobile communications device was called the T-Mobile Sidekick. I don't know if you you remember that device, but it was um, a cult favorite amongst some celebrities at that point in time. I carried on the wireless industry for a while and then I came to the place of having children. And I got (laughs) married a little bit later. And so I had children in my late thirties and I had been living on airplanes up to that point in time. And so when I had my first child, I really was unclear on how I could do both, right? How Mm -hmm. I could do the the job and the work that I really enjoy doing and had been doing for almost 20 years and be the kind of parent that I wanted to be and thought that I should be. And so I did jump out at that point in time without really strategy and thought put behind it, but I took a little bit of time off and I know I had, you know, I'm I'm grateful I had the luxury of being able to do that for a short period of time, but I moved into what, you know, what we, what women often do is move into more of the flexible work space. And for me, that meant consulting work. And I came in and out of projects during that, that time frame. Um, but I also became deeply fascinated and interested in identity, women's identity around career and motherhood and fascinated around working mothers versus working fathers and the different kinds of of challenges that each face. And and so it it really became this passion of mine and, and really how all of those areas around um, the challenges and opportunities of, of working mothers flows into greater gender equality. And so that led to a business before I started the human group that led to a business that was called um, Mom Warrior and it was focused on supporting working mothers. And we did that for about two years, working with different organizations around better supporting working mothers. But it was honestly a a little surprisingly before it's time. And again, this is pre-pandemic. What came out of that was really this deep understanding of how important leaders are in the equation of supporting working parents. And so when I founded the human group in 2019, it was really around how do we create leaders that are gender, culture, and generation intelligent, right? And the underlying that piece around gender flows into the area around supporting working mothers, because we know that in order to get to gender balance in organizations, we absolutely need to address uh, those challenges and opportunities that, that working mothers face. And so come pandemic, so much of the work that I have been doing is really in that gender column. However, my background and experience is also deeply intertwined into the culture piece. So I continue to do a lot of work in in that area as well. And then the third pillar of the human group is developing 
generation intelligent leaders. And essentially what that means is, as we know, people are retiring a lot later in life, right? And we know that we have Gen Z entering the workforce and more often than not, we're finding teams that have a really, really wide aid disparity. And so getting our leaders and ourselves to better understand those aspects are really critical in, in the leadership roles as well. The one aspect as you're talking about the cultural um, part of your organization, it brings me to the next question. As you've um, created a movie called Global Mothers, Global Daughters. And I will definitely put a link in the show notes and I highly recommend it to every listener to watch it. It is really so thought provoking and it really shows all the different cultures. But please, you know, can you tell me more about what made you decide to create the movie and how did you find the people participating. I was so curious. I know. I, I had such a great experience with that. And I have to say that that was my first time getting into really putting a film together and editing. Prior to this, I had no editing experience whatsoever. And so it was a long process for me. <laughs> I learned so much, but it started really just around this area of a curiosity about others and a curiosity about cultural identity. And I had so many friends through my own daughters in school that I was meeting some close friends, some acquaintances who grew up in other countries from all over the world. And having lived in, you know, in my 20s and 30s, having lived in other parts of this world, the world, I certainly understood it from an individual perspective around what it was like to live in a country and a culture other than my own. But raising children in that other culture is a whole nother context. And I was really curious about that because ultimately these women, these mothers were had no comparisons, right? right For me, right. I grew up in California and now I've ended up back in California and my children are going to school in California. So I pretty much know what to expect. They're in public school too. And as we know, public school hasn't changed much in the last 50 years. And right. so I pretty much understand the process of school and what that looks like and the kinds of things that they'll be studying. But I kept thinking, you know, if I had grown up in Nigeria, if I had grown up in Taiwan, if I had grown up in Colombia, if I had grown up in Peru, and and were um, and my kids were going to school there, I would have so many questions not answered and things that were new to me as well that that I would be living vicariously right through my children, and so. All of these women that I had come to know basically through my, my kids' school predominantly, um, I just, I started to get to know them and they're all interesting, wonderful, fascinating women. And I asked them, I said, would you be willing to tell your story on film? And all of them said, absolutely. So boy, we, we had, this is, this is, I recorded this really in 2017 and it took me a couple of years. There was some time on the shelf that it sat and it took me a couple of years to really pull it all together and pull all the edits. I had about 60 to 80 minutes of footage per, per um, woman. And to cut that down as a new editor was quite a process. Yeah. So it did take a little bit of time, but I really just wanted to hear their stories ultimately. And what the, the, the piece about it that was so wonderful for me is that I did not know where the storyline would be going when I recorded these sessions. I had the questions that I asked and I, the story found itself ultimately. And the story is really about no matter where we come from as mothers, we want the same for our daughters. It doesn't matter if I grew up in uh, Japan or if I grew up in South Africa, at the end of the day, what I wish for, for my daughters and ultimately for myself is not 
different depending on on where we come from. And it was such a great experience. And I got to know each of these women even more deeply and was so grateful they were sharing their their personal uh, experiences with me. And so I, I it was a passion project and I love doing it. And and I do do hope to do another one in the in the coming years for sure. Yeah, it's what I found was also so interesting as you know, I'm supporting professionals returning back to paid work and some of them are expats or in general have moved to a different country. And it also, your movie really also showed what courage it takes to move to another country to, as you said, raise your children and not know all of the background, the, the traditions. And, you know, I have my own experience. My kids started being raised in the US and now we are in Canada and I'm German originally. And there were so many things I had no idea about at all. So, yeah, so I can, you know, I, I really, really appreciated your movie. And, oh, I, you. and I'm hoping that in the future, you know, maybe there could be one about fathers. I would love to see that as well. Absolutely. I will 100% do another movie. And I do believe it is so important to bring men into the conversation around caregiving and gender equality and parenting and fathers of daughters and not to diminish sons and the importance of sons because they certainly are of equal importance in our next future generation. But, um, but I will absolutely do another movie. It was such a great experience. I enjoyed every minute of it. It's just uh, time and life, right? <laughs> time and life for sure. Yes, absolutely. And you know, that brings us to my next question. You are teaching a course at Stanford University titled Motherhood and Work Challenges and Opportunity for Change. And can you share a bit more about that class with our listeners and what made you decide to teach that particular class? Absolutely. Uh, this course and me hoping to get this course into Stanford happened before the pandemic. And there's quite a long process to get something um, on the books there, mm -hmm. for sure. especially this was, this is my first time uh, teaching at Stanford as well. So it took, it was, it was quite a, a long path to get there, but I am so, I have a lot of passions, <laughs> <laughs> the cultural passions, cultural contexts, uh, travel and all of that, as well as this area around motherhood and work. And as I mentioned in this, the, the early conversation we were having around when I started to really dig into things, it was at a point in, in time when lots, lots was happening at this point in time, I think, but I was so curious around women's stories. And yes, the women's stories on the the cultural identity side and the mothers of daughters piece was going on, but also as the culture, the, the identity of, of just being a mother in general mm -hmm. and, and relating to work and how we, you know, that conflict between being an ideal worker and an ideal mother and how we do it. And Fathers don't have these same kinds of conflicts. That's not saying they don't come across conflicts between work and family life ever, because they do, but it's just different. And I dug so deep into the research for a couple of years there. And I think what I really discovered was that the way I felt about being a mother, which of course I love to be, and I love my children, and, but the way I felt in terms of my identity is that I am so much more than a mother. Yes, I'm a mother and I love being a mother, but my whole identity is not mother. Mother is a piece of my identity. And I was struggling so much around all of that. 
And when I started to you know, read the research and really dig into this and realize that I'm not alone with that identity conflict and I'm not alone with the challenge of working and raising children that and and all the facts and the data that goes into all of this research that shows globally that working mothers face extreme challenges, which is holding us back from gender equality. When I found all that data out, it was in many ways very relieving that I was not alone in those thoughts. Mm -hmm. And that the facts and the data are really there to back us up. So when we go out and advocate for ourselves at work or advocate for ourselves within our homes, whatever we need to do, that the data is there to back us up. And so I really wanted to create a course that would empower women with the data and with the facts so that they wouldn't feel alone. And they, they had this, this power behind them really of global research behind them when, when they needed to either not feel alone or to advocate for themselves. And so, so much of that was the impetus of wanting to teach this course and also just share and spread the data. Yeah. <laughs> because until the pandemic, there wasn't a lot of talk. I mean, there's a lot of talk around it, but in pockets and yes, the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, the OECD, the International Labor Organization, and the list goes on. All of these organizations really focus deeply on what can be done to improve conditions for working mothers specifically because they know and we know that gender equality will not be achieved unless we look at women and unpaid work and mothers and all of that. And so now that the pandemic has hit, there's certainly been a spotlight that is put on these issues, as we know. Yeah. Um, but this course has really come at the perfect time to kind of map out even next steps. Like what are, we have this, this, these facts and this data now. So now what next, right? Yeah, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. It, it's a perfect time that, you know, before especially unpaid care work was so invisible and all of a sudden with all the Zoom calls and kids, dogs, you know, coming in, it, it kind of really shows much more the whole person instead of their um, work persona only yes. and now what I'm curious about because earlier you were talking about you know also an aspect of um, your work with leadership in organizations so who are the people who are attending your classes are there leaders within corporations because to me it sounds like a perfect class Yes, the majority are. There are some that came to the class as women that had exited the workforce. They were professionals mm -hmm. with, a, with a monetary income, right? Mm -hmm. And so they took a break from the workforce and are at a stage where they're looking to re-enter the workforce. So I did do have some, some women who are in that category who have that professional background took a break and are looking at the possibilities of re-entering and, and getting empowered with the data to know what that's going to look like for them. And then the other, the majority of the piece are in fact working mothers. Ironically, more on the millennial side, which is wonderful because with younger children, and I always think, gosh, if I had this data and this knowledge, even before I had children, I, it would be different because I think women and mothers really just, there's so much of what we want is acknowledgement and acceptance. And if we're not going to necessarily get that from other people, the, the, the data and the research gives us that. And so there is a little bit of a relieving sense when you know this, this information. It also is infuriating. <laughs> Um, and it does fill us as women with a little bit of rage to know that so little has changed over such a long period of time. 
But I do believe we've hit this point now. We've hit this point where if change doesn't happen in organizations, in culture, in society, if change doesn't happen, then we're really going to be going backwards. I, I think that the awareness, the awareness is there. And it's just shifting the awareness to change. And I believe organizations can lead in that. I, I completely agree. And I feel that just by, you know, reading up and seeing how much more, I would say, outspoken people have become during the pandemic. I, I really think this is a, um, you know, a silver lining out of it. And I mean, to me, the fact that now here we are on LinkedIn, we have now an official job title as stay-at-home parent, mom, dad, caregiver, which I just think is awesome. And um, I, you know, to me, I believe or am hoping that that will really normalize that type of anybody's work history, which predominantly at the moment, there are, um, you know, stay-at-home moms, but I have heard more and more about stay-at-home dads. And I truly believe we need to have more male role models that show that they too can do unpaid care work and that flexible work, what you also, you know, mentioned. It's like, um, yeah, it's besides breastfeeding, as some of my dad advocate guests have said, right. nothing really can be, you know, be not done by dad. So I'm, I'm very optimistic. Yes, I am too. I'm very optimistic. And there's, there's only one country that is worse than the US in terms of policies uh, for family leave, maternity, paternity leave, and that's Papua New Guinea. And otherwise, <laughs> the US is at the very bottom. So we know that policies have to change. But also, things in our society and culture have to have to shift. Yeah. And that's, that's a big, that's a big shift. But with the pandemic, it's like in science, it's called a punctuated equilibrium, where there's something massive that occurs that causes systems and structures, forces systems and structures to change. And I really believe that this pandemic is a punctuated equilibrium of sorts, and it's going to force systems and structures to change. Otherwise, they organizations won't, won't have employees. There's too much integration of work and life that is our future. There's no separation, as we know, any longer. And so organizations have to change the way things have been done, change their policies, shift their cultures. Uh, the list goes on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I loved your quote from a previous um, article on LinkedIn. And it, you said, while the women's movement across the globe has been very successful in helping women break into formally male-dominated market of paid labor, there has been no corresponding movement of men into the female-dominated non-market of unpaid labor, which is mostly performed within the home. And um, yeah, I really hope that this is how you said the punctuated equilibrium Yes, a punctuated equilibrium. Yes, I think based that quote is really basically the definition of a stalled gender revolution. Yeah. And Paula England is a sociologist who's done great, amazing work around what the stalled gender revolution is. And Arlie Hoke's child who wrote The Second Shift in the 1980s, that book is still relevant today as it was then. And, and also has done a lot of work around the stall gender revolution. But basically what that's saying and what that quote is, is really inferring is that we have been so focused on women changing, women moving into male dominated careers, women taking on 
more of this or more of that or shifting and changing women talking to other women. Yeah. But what we haven't been seeing is this, co- this corresponding shift of men into traditionally female oriented careers yeah. or men into equalizing their unpaid work alongside their, their partners in the home. And until those things happen, getting the gender equality is going to be a long road because the balance is not ever going, we're never going to have that balance. And and that's also where Paula England and and Arlie Hochschild, they they do a lot of research on this too, or more, I think it's more of Paula England around this notion of masculinity and femininity. And these are jobs that are traditionally female oriented or considered feminine jobs and so all this talk right now, it's all intertwined right around what is masculinity? Is caregiving masculine? Is it not? And all that is a cultural shift that needs to happen too in order for change to be made in society and on the organizational level, et cetera. It needs to become okay and it really acceptable for men to be fully integrated into the caregiving of, of their children. And I think they want to be so, but it's just uh, the, it still has stigma attached from historical gendered norms, right? Over, over time and history. I mean, I completely agree. And that's why I feel every time I read about somebody or see a male leader that actively speaks out that he is either maybe doing flexible working or is um, taking paternal leave or in general doing more unpaid care work. I think until we get to equality there, we have to particularly emphasize it and, and you know, shout that out so that junior leader as, uh, you know, or junior employees and organizations realize um, it is okay as a dad to take paternity leave, to say I'm going to watch my kids theater play or football game or whatever it might be. Yes. And likewise, it is this notion of, you know, traditionally there, there's a test and I'm forgetting who the, the oh, I'm forgetting the, the right now it's on the tip of my tongue, but the test is called flip it to test it. Uh-huh. And I love looking at things that way. And basically what that's saying is if something doesn't sound right in the workplace or at home, when you're saying something, if it doesn't work for another gender, or you can even say if it doesn't work for another race or ethnicity or culture, then we need to think twice about us saying that. And in this context, it is that it has been more, so it's a double-edged sword, but When a father does ask to leave to do something related to caregiving, Mm -hmm. because it is not as common, it is looked at and viewed as, um, wow, he is such a great dad. Amazing that he is taking this time and this focus. The double-edged sword piece is also that historically organizations have said, you know, what do you, you you have someone else to take care of that. Why do you need to take it? Isn't your wife taking care of that at home kind of thing, right? We have that going on. But at the same time, we also have it being a sweet, cute, wonderful dad thing when the father does take time for caregiving because it's so rare traditionally. And in, in the flip side, we don't have that same response when mothers take that time. It is a stigmatized situation, right? Where there is that motherhood bias that, that comes into play of the, the feeling that she must not be devoted to her work or uh, she doesn't have the commitment that we want at this organization, et cetera. So until we can get rid of all that stigma and shift things and normalize things across gender, caregiving across gender, that too is what needs to happen to improve things and and move 
forward in terms of gender balance and uh, caregiving and work and flexibility and all that good stuff. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, you know, you mentioned flexibility and you mentioned intergenerational working before. And what is so interesting is that, you know, I'm a big fan of job sharing or top sharing when it is on a, done on a management level. And one aspect of job sharing is to do intergenerational job sharing where you then have maybe somebody who is, um, you know, planning to retire within the next five or 10 years and might not want to work full time. And then somebody who might be younger and might be having a side hassle or, or studying in addition or doing something where he or she would like to work um, um, part-time hours. And so to me, job sharing, I feel can really help also to better understand people across different generations. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and so that's sort of, I always struggle and I always, you know, wonder if my guests have additional insights on why job sharing is still such an, relatively speaking, uncommon type of flexible work around the world. And I mean, in Europe it is definitely, I would say, more common. But it's so interesting, you know, it basically started in the US and in Canada 40 years ago. And um, still, when I tell people here in Canada about job sharing, they're very surprised that it exists. Yeah. Right. It is really interesting. I mean, there's so many different types of flexible work, right? <clears throat> and job sharing being one of them. And, you know, it, it brings me to this thinking that I had when I first became a mom and, you know, I have friends who are doctors and lawyers, women friends who are doctors and lawyers too. And what I found with them is that there was a part, a point in time in their careers where they decided to back down to part-time work. Mm -hmm. um, you can't job share necessarily in the, in the, in the medical world, but so that where they did back down to part-time work and I kept thinking about, and, and then when that season for them passed, you know, whether that had been babies or toddlers, they went right back to full time. And sure, they took pay cuts during that time, but otherwise they, they were able to flex, flex back and then flex up again mm -hmm. when the time was right. And all during that time, I kept saying, this is fascinating because when they had dropped to part-time, they're still a doctor and they're still a lawyer. They are not anything but a doctor and a lawyer, whether they're working full-time or part-time. But in business, it is different. In business, part-time roles are typically junior level roles. And so if you are a senior level individual in a company and you wanna to go to part-time, it really doesn't exist. And so, from that context, I find this fascinating because it was, it's very much a, you're either in it or you're out, which is different than law and medicine. And maybe that has to do with billable hours or shift work, who knows. But the, to get back to your, your question about sharing, job sharing, it's a really great opportunity for when those seasons of life come, where you want to step back for a short period of time, that is the greatest opportunity to do job sharing. But you're right, there is absolutely no understanding really of what that could do for an organization. And I think it does come down to the partnership of your job share, sharer, right? Yeah. And it really does come to that. In real estate, we see that all the time, and it's a very successful model. So I, I can imagine that in time, companies just need to really start looking at 
what kinds of flexible work offerings are out there and be very clear at the positive impact that those things can have for the long, long-term engagement of their employees and the long-term health and wellness of their company as well, right? Right. right. Yeah, now you're bringing up really, really good points. And it's interesting, you know, I actually read about lawyers who were job sharing and also in the medical field. I, I was surprised, to be honest. And, and one of um, the people I interviewed, he is actually managing, um, I think it's close to 200 people. But I think one of the studies one of my guests had done, they were saying that the majority of the people did not know when they, you know, were interviewed for their study that top sharing where you could actually manage people in a part-time capacity existed. They really wanted to do it once they were aware of it. But so, so I feel that it's just so much more awareness raising that needs to be done across the world, really. Yeah, it really does. You know, I think when we talk about flexible work, I, I think there are very few companies in the world, if, if any, to be honest, I don't, I don't necessarily have any great examples out there for the best of the best mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, who, who are, who are really doing flexible work successfully across the board. But I do believe we have pockets of exception yeah. all the time. There are pockets of exception within those organizations. It may not be the whole organization, mm-hmm. but the pockets of exception have to do with leaders. Yeah, It really does. They have to do with leaders. And that's really what I focus on right now at the human group are these leaders, because these are the leaders that have been able to successfully engage their employees by giving them control over how and when they work, because that's ultimately what employees want is they want to control their time. Yeah. And so those leaders who are successful in that have established psychological safety. They've established um, strong, and it goes beyond that to psychological meaningfulness, psychological availability. All those things have come together for employees to feel engaged and able to pursue flexible work in the way that works best for them. And so those are the leaders that we need more of, who are able to establish teams that can work how, when, and where they want. Thank you. That that is so important because, um, you know, I'm starting to read all of these. How are we returning back to work now, right? Is it all remote still for a period of time? Is it hybrid? And what does hybrid really mean? And I feel it's going to be more maybe complex of how, you know, the flexibility as far as location is than it would have been before as well as during the pandemic, I feel. Yes, absolutely. Again, I think that what employees want is simply to control their schedule without stigma, period. Yeah. And the way to do that is to be really clear too on Teams is what does flexible work mean to you? Because when we talk flexible work, as you know, being an expert in digging into this for so long, but flexible work means different things to different people. So when one person raises their hand and they say, you know, I I want to work flexibly, that's going to look very differently person A and person B. So being very clear on what that is and being open as a leader to making that work for everyone, for what works for them. And that's, that's ultimately the goal that I believe and what the research is showing is where teams are going to be most successful and ultimately 
if if your organization is full of those kinds of teams, then you know th- there is no there there is no limit to the number of stars by your name, right? <laughs> no, I I fully agree. Now, Christy, it's really fascinating to listen to you and with all your insights and global background. Is there anything that you would like to share with our listeners today that we have not covered yet? Oh, gosh, I'm sure there's a thousand different things because, uh, you know, I, there, I could talk about people and culture and motherhood and work till the end of time. But ultimately, I just, you know, right now I'm in this space of how to bring the knowledge and the awareness to women, to mothers, to men also around all of the challenges and opportunities that exist in the world today around women and work ultimately, right? And how we make change, how we advocate for change, because change is imminent. It ha- things have to. We've been, we've been on a plateau for too long and this pandemic we know has set reaching of gender equality back by decades because so many women have have left the workforce in in the U.S. and and I know that's globally as well. So, yeah, but we can do it. I believe I'm, I am an optimist and I believe with the right efforts put in place. And I believe that organizations are best poised to lead the way and make change more than government and policy Um, that has to happen too, but organizations can really uh, make waves of change if they, if they, put their mind to it, not just raise their hand, but really put, put work into it. Absolutely. How can people reach out to you, Christy? I am on LinkedIn under Christy Rival. Feel free to connect with me or message me there. I'm trying my hardest on Instagram at Christy Rival. My Instagram is at Christy Rival. Um, feel free to reach out to me there. And, and I love to connect with people. I really do. So I'm, I'm happy. I love store hearing people's stories. Please, please feel free to reach out. Those are the best, best avenues. And then my website, uh, thehumangroup.com. Human has two U's, <laughs> but at www.thehumangroup.com, you can see a little bit about what we're doing and, and as we grow the different different areas that we're going to continue to focus on. And, and leadership coaching is, is a big piece of that uh, now as well. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you so much. It was great to meet you. And I could talk all day about these topics. And um, as long as we get change too, right? We don't want all talk and no, no change. So let's, let's hope we move the needle in, in places that it needs to be moved. Yes, I definitely agree. So thank you very much for being my guest and sharing more of your insights. So then when people listen to this, they can use that information to be more informed when they talk to leaders within their organization. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Karen. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to the show. We hope you gained valuable insights and new ideas. To keep listening to future episodes, please head over to iTunes or your favorite player and subscribe and give it a rating. We would very much appreciate a review and for you to share it on social media so more people can start innovating in how they offer employment. Until the next time, goodbye.